my last question was, let me go back on my list. Hold on. There we go. So talk of biomarker advancement has been going on for a while now. And I think we've touched on this through this conversation already. With Prolenia developing a pre-symptomatic study, are we now at a stage of having useful and reliable biomarkers, even for pre-symptomatic trials? That's my question. Yes. And that's where this whole kind of IS concept comes in. And the ISS is really a, 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 a framework that we can hang biomarkers onto. So a biomarker is really anything that we can measure that tells us something useful about the brain or body of someone with a disease. And in the case of HD, obviously, we're interested in how healthy someone's brain is, how rapidly their HD may be progressing. And crucially, if we're giving them a drug, is that drug working to protect neurons? And the because the IS is a regulatory framework, the regulators have, very, have a very high threshold for even thinking about biomarkers, because the FDA and the other regulators, they're all about clinical, meaningful clinical benefit. So they want to license drugs that produce benefit where a patient says, I took this drug and I feel better, or I am better than I was. And that's the FDA's kind of cutoff. And obviously that works in something like depression or cancer. I used to have cancer and now I don't. But if we're gonna produce meaningful clinical benefit, we have to show that it's meaningful and also that, that it's clinical. And believe it or not, even if you can show that a drug is slowing down the shrinkage in someone's brain with HD, the FDA won't let you license a drug on that basis because it's theoretically possible that you could slow down the shrinkage in the brain, but make no difference to the eventual clinical outcomes. And so if you're not actually making the patient better now or in the future, and you're just treating on the basis of success on a brain scan or some other biomarker, then the FDA doesn't want to give a thumbs up to that drug. And there's some argument for saying you should let people take that risk themselves. We want to take a drug that slows down the death of our brain cells or the measurement of the death of our brain cells, even if there's some risk that later on it may turn out that wasn't helpful to us. And that's what conditional approval is. And aducanumab was the first drug ever that the FDA granted a conditional approval for that's an Alzheimer's disease drug. And it showed some slowing of some biomarker scan changes in a trial and would look to be safe. And so it was licensed. And actually, the FDA granted conditional ap approval and the drug ended up being prescribable. But actually, they're, in, in the end, the insurance companies just didn't want to pay for it because they thought it, they found it to be too risky. And so that drug got stuck in limbo in a way. And actually, it probably ultimately isn't going to make a massive difference. And certainly there have been other development since then in Alzheimer's that will probably be more meaningful. But the broader picture is we want to get into a system where we can say, this is a biomarker of Huntington's disease. It detects clinical progression. It predicts more rapid progression. And the drug moved it in the direction that we would like it to. And we have reason to believe that is going to predict benefit. But I think first you have to, you really have to connect the dots between the biomarker and the clinical progression, not only in the natural history of the disease, but also in the context of treatment so what we unless the fda dramatically changes its direction what we're going to need to prove is that if we look at something like neurofilament neurofilament is up in people with hd it's higher in people whose hd is progressing more quickly and we re, we suspect that if we give someone a drug that's working the neurofilament will drop it will end up it will end up lower than it was at the start of the trial. And therefore that would ultimately, hopefully produce a clinical benefit. But we, there is a risk that we could show that something's reducing neurofilament, but then it doesn't actually change the direction of the disease. And the IS is designed to basically accommodate the possibility of biomarker trials and present the biomarker changes in a way that the FDA agrees is rational and sensible. And, but we need the biomarkers to flesh it out. At the moment, we just have MRI as the only one that has enough data behind it. Neurofilament's probably next. But then we need to show that we can move it in a favorable direction, which no drug has done. And then we need to show that predicts predicts ultimately clinical success. Once we've done that once or twice, then we'll start to get drugs licensed on the basis of biomarkers. So first of all, if you think about something like heart disease, your cholesterol's up, you're more likely to have a heart attack. That was well known. So does lowering cholesterol reduce the risk of heart attacks? Probably but you have to prove it. It's not, so when the first cholesterol lowering drugs came out, it wasn't enough just to say, this makes people's cholesterol go down. So you had to give us a license. You had to run a long trial to say, this reduces people's cholesterol. And if you do that, then they have fewer heart attacks. Now, as long as your drug behaves like every other drug in terms of safety, 
all you have to show is that it reduces cholesterol and it's safe and tolerated. And it's well enough established that lowering cholesterol will eventually reduce the risk of heart attacks. But you have to build a solid case that's beyond reasonable doubt before you can start selling your drug to people. It's a field where there has been huge progress, though. So this is a really hard one. You ready? I love a hard one. All right. All right. We keep seeing shutdowns of trials that we keep hearing peripheral neuropathy brought up a lot. And it looks like this may be the cause of a lot of trials halting or being discontinued. We also hear a lot about medications that cause neuropathy that are approved and are on market. Is the risk of neuropathy really worth shutting down a trial before the benefit of the trial is known? Also, has the community been asked if this is a symptom that they could live with if the benefit of the potential therapy shows efficacy in slowing down the disease? Yeah, so this sounds like a question about Branaplan, which was the Novartis drug that was a pill which lowers Huntington. And it was the first of these small molecule pills that was tested in HD to try and lower production of Huntington protein in the brain. The the trial was stopped because, as the question says, because the drug was causing peripheral neuropathy, which is damage to the nerves in the body as opposed to the neurons in the brain. And similarly, this was actually a known risk of Branaplan because Branaplan actually came from spinal muscular atrophy. It was never actually licensed in SMA because there are much better drugs that came along in the meantime. And so Novartis, along the way, discovered that it lowered Huntington and then decided to test the drug in Huntington's disease. And the, tri- the trial was stopped late last year or early this year, I can't remember, a few months ago, because the drug was, because there were electrical signs on electrical testing and on clinical testing and on blood tests that the drug was causing peripheral neuropathy. And actually what that means is harm to neurons, which is not a great starting point for a drug that we want to rescue neurons. Like a peripheral nerve is a neuron just as much as a brain nerve is a neuron. And something that's harmful to peripheral nerves would have to work super hard if it's going to be end up protecting brain neurons. There definitely are drugs out there that cause peripheral neuropathy that are licensed, but those tend to fall into two categories. One category would be things like treatments for cancer, where a person's going to die within a year if they don't get treatment for their cancer. So you give them one year of really toxic drugs, including drugs that might mean that they never feel their feet again because you've damaged the nerves in their arms and legs. And But that person's alive rather than dead. The two things about that are, number one, the drugs are super effective at curing cancer. And you would never, you would, and all of the data leading to those drugs being given to humans suggested that they would be super effective in curing cancer and therefore worth the known risk of peripheral neuropathy. The other thing is that those treatments are short term. So you cause a, a, a lot of kind of expected suffering in the short term, but then you stop the drug. And as soon as you stop the drug, you know, it's not going to get worse. And it's, or it, it, in many cases, it actually resolves. So that's the first category, the kind of bazooka drugs for cancer and things. And peripheral neuropathy is quite disabling actually and there are people who are who can't walk or can't use their hands because of that peripheral neuropathy but the upside is they're alive rather than dead because they didn't die of cancer so the second group is drugs that are that are that rarely cause a peripheral neuropathy and there are lots of those but things like heart drugs for heart arrhythmias can sometimes cause they have a sort of low but known risk of causing a peripheral neuropathy. It's a small minority of patients. When it happens, it's generally mild and you stop the drug and it gets better. If you keep treating with the drug in those patients who are susceptible, chances are the neuropathy will get worse and they'll end up so disabled that they wish they hadn't taken the drug or that they would wish that they would have taken one of the many other drugs available for the treatment of that condition. So what about Huntington's disease and Branaplam and the peripheral neuropathy there? So within just a few months of treatment with Branaplan, um, I think it was two thirds of patients had shown some evidence of of patients on drug had shown some evidence of peripheral neuropathy, either on the electrical tests or on the clinical tests of things like sensation and reflexes or on the blood test for neurofilament, which is a sensitive test of nerve damage. So this was really a drug that that degree of neuropathy was unexpected. We knew that neuropathy was a risk and because we knew that might be okay if it was relatively mild and a relatively small number of people, that they folded in the nerve tests and the trial went ahead. The trial was stopped when it turned out that the risk of neuropathy was 
bigger than expected and the neuropathy was more common than expected. And the reality is that it, because the brain and the peripheral nerves are very closely related, it's quite likely, I think, that drug, by, in, by the similar mechanism to how it harmed peripheral nerves, could easily have ended up harming nerves in the brain. And that is just a really difficult, it's very difficult to see that the drug could have made a meaningful difference to HD. But even if it had, a lot of that difference would have ended up very difficult to detect because of the loss of functioning in the body that the drug was causing. And also, if you, if you even if you game out that scenario, you're going to end up with a drug that's the first licensed drug for Huntington's disease, but it causes peripheral neuropathy in nearly everyone. And the longer you're on the drug, the worse that neuropathy is going to get. There's no, it's not like the cancer drug where it's a short, sharp shock, and then you stop the drug and everything's stable. These are drugs that people need to keep taking probably for the rest of their lives. And the, so it's just really, I, there was a decision the company I know took reluctantly, but in the end, really everything converged on, on the idea that this was an unexpectedly severe and common degree of neuropathy. It may not have been the only issue in the trial. And we're waiting for the full results of things like the brain scans and the clinical data from that trial to, to come out. But it's not that neuropathy is automatically a deal breaker in HD or any other condition. It's that the, neur the neuropathy is a sign that the drug is was problematic in ways that were worse than expected that could have a direct that may would have made it very difficult for the drug to, to to show that it had any benefit at all and so yeah that's why it was discontinued but actually other drugs with a similar mechanism are still being tested and those drugs don't seem to have the same neuropathy issue so it's not like this is an inevitable consequence of Huntington lowering what I'm saying is even at the level of experimental drugs the HD community doesn't have to accept that peripheral neuropathy is an inevitable consequence of testing drugs to lower the Huntington protein. We know that there are there are other drugs in this class and other drugs licensed for SMA that have a similar mechanism. Rizdiplam is one of them that don't produce peripheral neuropathy. And I think what it comes down to is just selecting the best drugs for HD. And that may well end up being drugs designed for HD that have been selected on the basis of being super specific to HD as opposed to having a kind of general effect on the switching on and off of other genes. Thank you for that. I think people just get so, so excited when they hear about a new trial and it's hope. Right? And so it's just, it kills you and you just, you're struggling to find any answer. And no one really talked about how you may end up in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. And they didn't present it like that. No, absolutely. And these things come out in such kind of little drips of information there's an there's a minimum amount of information the company has to publish and then there's saying anything beyond that before the data have been fully analyzed could end up meaning that you say something that later turns out not to be true so obviously they're cautious about that but they also don't want to don't want to spook people away from the field in general and these things are always a balance there's, I don't think there's any good way to handle these information releases. If the news is bad, it's going to feel bad. All we have to do really is try to get back on the horse as quickly as possible. And for me, this has been a big thing in the past two years because we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of the failure of the Generation HD1 trial. And obviously that was, a, that was heartbreaking for everyone. And it's only a failed trial if we don't learn as much as we can from it and then use that information to build a better drug or a better trial. And that's, that is what's happening. But if something bad happens, it's completely appropriate for everyone to be sad. And thank you for being so thorough on that, because I think it's something that's a little bit misunderstood as far as there are some side effects that come through with trials, but what are we willing to accept? And what does that mean long-term? Like there's just so many different degrees and levels of of each trial. So I think you being thorough is Absolutely. going to be very helpful. Gina, that's a really good point. And actually, if, if there was really good evidence already from that program internally at Novartis, that it was causing a peripheral neuropathy, and that was more severe and more common than expected, but that the drug was knocking it out of the park in terms of rescuing brains, the company would have said that and they would have plowed ahead and really doubled down on developing the drug. The company right. only having spent all that money on setting the trial up, the company is only going to pull out if it's if there isn't really any realistic prospect of producing more good than harm. Absolutely. And it's interesting because I'm like on the side of the question going, 
absolutely. We, we need to be able to have that choice. And then when you're like, it shows signs of neuron like depletion or damage. I'm like, oh, that's, yeah. that's why yeah. I don't make these decisions. Right. I'm not that educated for obvious right. medical things. So as a community member, I'm like, oh, that's a big thing yeah. I didn't think about. So that's actually another really important point, Trina, which is that so many people in the HD community are so enthusiastic about research and about science and about wanting to do everything that they possibly can and wanting to sign up for anything. I've had so many people say to me in clinic, you can do anything to me. I don't care if it kills me, right? Yeah. Do what you need. I just want to help my kids or my nieces and nephews. And that's an incredibly generous thing to say. Yeah. But it also it also puts those people in a vulnerable position where actually if, if a company or, or someone is unscrupulous they could say these are people that are willing to do anything so i'm going to do something that doesn't have much chance of working or right. i'm going to be i'm going to minimize the effect of the description of this particular side effect which i know is a risk and because these people will do anything maybe i'll get another round of investment and I, then i can buy a yacht i'm not saying that was yeah. what happened here I, in fact the opposite happened here i think the company conducted itself really well but there there is that risk and it's something that we've seen we've seen people who have said gone online and basically typed into Google, I have Huntington's disease, I will do anything to rescue my brain and rescue my kids. And that's where you end up with trips to Eastern Europe to have stem cell injections or like shark cartilage or that kind of thing. And it's like, there are, there are unscrupulous people out there who will take that positivity and that generosity and unfortunately exploit it. And part of the whole, the reason the regulatory framework has ended up being so cautious is to protect people. So try and make sure that enthusiasm and that altruism and that selflessness does, is less likely to be exploited. It's more likely to be put towards genuine scientific advancement. Yes. And, and I'm sure you've seen it in some of the different groups online where we sometimes people don't get fully filtered. And so we'll have somebody in there. I was cured from Huntington's from taking these vitamins. And you're just yeah. like, help because the average Joe, let's say that doesn't have any neurodegeneration going on, might read that and go, okay, come on. But somebody who is in later stages, HD, that may have just that, that cognitive decline where they're hopeful, but they're also maybe not able to think as clearly as they would have prior to symptoms showing up might jump on that and might spend thousands of dollars on these vitamins because they're impulsive and they're just trying to save their brain. And so it's a vulnerable state and it's scary. Absolutely. And it's, it's a real issue. Like two of my patients in London have paid to fly to the Greek island of Lesbos and a neurosurgeon, a sort of very charismatic neurosurgeon there has said, I have an operation that will cure Huntington's disease. And he, he makes incisions in the brain and the neurosurgeons I've spoken to who have seen the scans of these patients have said, this is a very well-conducted, technically well-conducted neurosurgical operation that anyone who knows anything about the brain will tell you can only do the patient harm. There's no prospect of this doing anything other than harm. And yet the, this is something that's been allowed to happen. And sometimes the motivation is money. Sometimes the motivation is I don't know, I guess, fame or notoriety, but it's a real problem. And it's basically the main reason why we set up HD Buzz in 2009 was that Jeff Carroll and I were, what's a polite way to put it, gossiping about the information that was available out there on the internet and what you saw when you Googled Huntington's disease research or Huntington's disease cure and how it was a lot of these, these things that, that anyone who knows the science of HD would tell you there's no way this is going to work. It, these are obviously scams to people who are in the business but if you're not in the business and um, most people aren't then it's it can be very difficult and so that's why we basically set up hd buzz to be plain english hd research news if we say something's unlikely to work hopefully you can believe that if we say something's got a good chance of working and is ethical 